Hi folks, welcome back. Uh, my name is Peter Lehrman. I am the founder and CEO of Axial. Uh, and today I have a really, really uh, interesting opportunity uh, to interview John Warlow. Many believe him to be uh, perhaps the world's foremost expert on building a company to sell. Um, he's written many books on it, but he's not just uh, someone who sits on the sidelines and writes books. He's been an entrepreneur himself multiple times owner, uh, multiple times over. Uh, sold multiple businesses, uh, one to a public company uh, and others to private acquirers. So this is someone who has spent their life not just as an owner and an operator as an entrepreneur, but then taking the time to sit down and write about it. Uh, he, man, I'm going to have you at my funeral, man. That sounds way better than, 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 uh, than I am. So I'm going to have to live up to these, uh, these tough feelings on, uh, on this conversation. Yeah, these so, lofty expectations you're setting. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I like to aim high as, uh, as I kick things <laughs> off. Uh, no, it's, John, it's great to have you. I've known you since really the, since I shortly after I started my own business. That's right. Uh, yeah. We were able to have either breakfast or lunch in New York on one of your trips. Um, yeah. And I think you were headed to maybe go take a year in France, I think was the plan at the time. Um, That's right. So yeah. anyway, we've, we've followed one another and I've certainly followed you at least for, for over a decade now. And it's great to, to have an opportunity to, to connect with you like this. So yeah, it's reciprocal. I love to see the growth of Axial. I think it's awesome. And you guys are taking a very opaque market and making it a lot more transparent. So uh, it's a great job. Well, we've joined forces, even though we work for different businesses, because I think you've done a lot of that with uh, the businesses that you've been building as well. And when you write books along the lines of what you've written, um, that certainly creates a huge amount of knowledge and, and transparency in the market as well. So, you know, you're known for, as an author, you're known for Built to Sell, right? Which was a book that you wrote on sort of how to think about prioritizing different aspects of business building so that your business can succeed uh, without you so that your business is sellable. Um, so maybe the best place to just jump in is what, what was not written about in that book that made you decide to pick up the pen again and write a whole new book? Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I do occasionally talk to entrepreneurs in the back of Built to Sell. I'll get asked to speak to, to audiences and, and one, not recently, of course, but, uh, but hopefully again soon. And one of the things that I find fascinating is that I'll do my regular shtick about building to sell, I'll talk about the drivers of company value, et cetera. And then at the end, I'll say, does anybody have any questions? And inevitably some guy in the audience like raises his hand and says, yeah, like how do I avoid an earnout? Or, you know, uh, like how do I tell my employees I'm thinking of selling? And the questions are not covered in built to sell. The, the questions that I was hearing are more, they're kind of like the mechanics of selling a company. And, and that's why I did the podcast. Um, I, we're up to 300 episodes of Built to Sell Radio now. So like I basically ask those questions and try to unpack for my audience, like some of the detailed questions that a lot of entrepreneurs have, but really have very few sources of getting it other than Axial and, and, and some of the, um, uh, the work that you do. So I try to, I try to get it out of folks in the, in a podcast. And then I've just looked at this library of interviews. I've done now 300 of them. And I realized that if I could curate some of these sort of secret ideas and hacks and negotiation tips and tricks that I've heard, it might be kind of compelling. So I, that's what I did. I kind of tried to curate some of these things into a book. And so when is the book going to be coming out? comes out January 12th. Yeah, it's called The Art of Selling Your Business. So it's, it's all about that, the, the, the kind of art as opposed to the science of selling. Okay. So um, I, you've, you've given me the manuscript, which as I told you before we started recording, um, I tore through it in the last sort of 36 to 48 hours. Very readable book. Um, so I've got a good sense for sort of the material that you've covered. I think one of the things that I just have to, maybe let's start here. You know, you mentioned in the book, um, you know, that the sale of a business is, is almost like a strip tease, um, you know, <laughs> like if you could channel your, your inner stripper um, that uh, you might actually be on track in terms of what it takes to effectively run a sale process for your business. I think when most people think of m a they definitely don't think of strippers. So can you connect the dots for us on this one, John? <laughs> oh, that's a great place to start. So, so listen, I mean, 
whether you're into watching guys take off their clothes at Chippendales or women take off their clothes at Solid Gold, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is that there is a reveal process that's involved in, in the striptease. It's been around for hundreds of years. And it's designed to effectively, obviously, stimulate the audience to uh, and to maximize their their sort of appeal of what is behind the curtain. And so the, the idea, and I couldn't think of a better analogy to use when we're talking about basically parsing out information in the process of selling your your business. So as you've seen, I'm sure in a lot of the transactions you guys cover, there is a way, a gated way to reveal information, right? So there's the letter of intent, there's a teaser, there's the management meetings, all of which are a different opportunity to reveal a little bit more information. What I see, and maybe you've seen some of the same thing in the entrepreneurs you've covered, is that oftentimes entrepreneurs sort of dump all of their information on an acquire all at once, right? They'll get a you know an inbound inquiry from a PE group, and they'll be like, yeah, here's my financials, here's you know here's all of our you know, brand guidelines, here's our customer list, you know here are my employees. Like, what do you think? Do you want to buy the company? <laughs> it's like the worst thing you can possibly do, right? Because you've essentially given up all of your ammunition, and now the acquirer is sort of in the driver's seat as to how they and if they want to respond to that. Whereas I think the savviest entrepreneurs, usually represented by really smart investment bankers, are are sort of just parsing out information at a strategic time in strategic timing so that all designed to sort of stimulate the desire of the market simultaneously so that that obviously you can create competitive tension and get more than one company to be uh, drawn into a process simultaneously and so, so that's, that's really that the that's what i was that. actually going to ask just you know to take the devil's advocate um you know, uh, perspective very quickly on this, right? If you are a seller of your business and you're a buyer of your business, why can't you just sort of like get down to business right away? Here's all my information. You decide whether or not you, you know, you want to buy the business or not. You're saying that's not the right approach to take. Um, but it certainly seems like the very open, honest, transparent, and efficient way to go. Like you're just giving them all the information, and, you know, is the primary reason you think that is the wrong approach? Because when you go to sell your business, you're trying to coordinate a variety of buyers and, and sort of get the, the, the timing synchronized or are there other reasons to, to reveal the information sequentially as opposed to just in one big you know, in one big dump. Like I, I get the coordination of multiple buyers as a reason to sort of hold the purse strings, but are there other reasons why an entrepreneur should should really appreciate the idea of slowly revealing information? Yeah, I, th I think there is. I mean, I think when you think back to your own experience of buying something, uh, in particular something that's of, of high value, maybe an emotional purchase, it is a, a a crescendo of of information that you are gleaning. You're you're looking at reviews. You're you're capturing more information, and the more information you get, the deeper and deeper you are falling in love with your decision to purchase. If you just get everything all at once, it it can be overwhelming and hard to metabolize. So if you're an acquirer, uh, it, it, you know, and you are being fed information on a a sort of drip cadence, it can be more stimulating than getting everything at once. So I think even if you want to do a negotiated sale, meaning neg negotiate the sale of your business with just one buyer, I think there is a little bit of a trickle effect that will heighten the desire of that single buyer. But to your point, the, the probably the biggest reason you don't want to do just give out all the information at once is you will get, uh, I think, better overall deal terms, harder deal terms, if you create some competitive tension. And that doesn't have to be some broad scale auction with hundreds of participants. It can simply be a couple of players at the table, you know, tightening up, firming up deal terms. And then I get the third maybe hidden reason that I think is maybe less understood, but, but arguably equally important is that diligence often gets protracted, dragged on, acquirers drag their feet when they know they're the only game in town. When, so when an acquirer thinks they've got a prop deal and they are the only game in town, you know, it can be on the back burner. That can be on the strategic back burner, meaning they, they want to extend you out for 90 days, 120 days to soften you up so they can retrade at the end. Or it can be simply that they know your prop deal and that, you know, they got three other deals on the go and, and you can wait. Either way, the owner gets more and more emotionally uh, you know, tied to the sale of their company, which makes them more susceptible to retrading at the end. Yeah. And so for that reason, 
you know, I think creating competitive tension through strategic release of information so that when you sign a letter of intent, um, you can ensure that the buyer honors the 60 days and the diligence period or whatever, you know, period they ask for. And that is, um, it's, it's, it's a much more likely cadence or schedule to, that they're going to stick to. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that you, you know, you talk about in the book a lot, and obviously the book I think is really speaking to entrepreneurs, right? I mean, that's really who the book speaks to in terms of its primary audience. But yeah. One of the things that you talk a, a lot about in the book is, uh, the importance of hiring specialized advisors for the transaction. Um, and among others, there are two that you mentioned as being, you know, sort of, um, you know, non-negotiable, not optional. One is an M&A attorney as opposed to a generalist attorney. Yeah. Um, and the other is uh, an, an intermediary, right? An investment banker, an M&A advisor, a business broker, depending on sort of the size and scope and scale of the business and the transaction. Um, what do you say to the business owner who has attempted to sell their business, has worked with an intermediary in the past, had a terrible experience, you know, and just wants to try and do it themselves? I mean, what is your advice to somebody who worked with someone in an intermediary capacity and it didn't work out well? What do you say to that person at the end of a speech if they give you that kind of a, a question, something like, you know, I'm never going to do that again. Why would, why would you persuade them to, to, to not go it alone? Yeah. I mean, I would say find a better M&A professional <laughs> because I believe they are worth their weight in gold and actually um, almost always pay for their full fee in creating a, you know, better deal terms for an entrepreneur. I mean, they're not, they're not cheap, you know, an M&A uh, you know, professional in, in, in the mid market, you know, you might end up paying, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even, even, even more than that for great representation. But I think they pay for themselves uh, well over and above that. I'm reminded of a story, um, a guy I actually interviewed for the podcast and, and he's in the book. Do you know, Eric Levy? He's a New York guy. I don't. Um, I wondered if, uh, if you'd ever had him. Um, entrepreneur uh, or in the, in the deal. He's an entrepreneur. Um, and he started a company that is in the same space as, um, you know, Whole Foods, they have those lockers for Amazon and you can oh, get yeah. stuff. He basically started a company that, that basically creates those lockers in apartment buildings in Manhattan. Hey, that, and you, pro he, you profile him in the book. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And to start this company, you know, it's fairly capital intensive business because you got to build all these lockers and these huge, you know, apartment buildings, et cetera. And, and, and at the time, you know, people buying online was increasing very, very quickly. Lots of people buying from Amazon and others. And so he wanted to kind of capture this market. So he went to Silicon Valley and to try to raise money for the business, did it himself, um, kind of created a book, went to Sand Hill Road, did the kind of road show and got crickets, right? Like some, you know, two year post MBA, you know, would, would sit there politely, listen to him in the meeting. And then they'd say, well, I'll have to check with my partner and the partner would never call them back. And so it went on for months and months and months. He came back from California with nothing raised and he decided to kind of do it out of, you know, bootstrap it, getting customers to pay in advance for the locker systems, et cetera. So he gets an offer from uh, not, an, not an acquisition offer, but, a, but an offer to buy his lockers from one of the largest retailers in the United States. They say, Eric, we want to put your lockers in every one of our stores. And Levy says, well, that's great. Uh, you know, you just have to pay whatever it is, 50% up front and blah, blah, blah. And they say, no, 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 we're not paying anything up front. We're going to pay in 60 days. And so Levy says, well, that's brutal because I can't finance 60 days here because it's literally like hundreds of thousands of lockers. It would, it would cost tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. And so he kind of puts his tail between his legs and, and goes home that night. And around the same time, he gets a note from a guy named Trip Wolf. Trip Wolf is, a, I think he was a PwC M&A banker um, who says, hey, I love your lockers. If you ever want to kind of raise capital or, you know, you need help, let me know. Yeah. And so he says, this is serendipitous, calls Trip and says, yeah, I need some money here because we've got to finance this massive order. And Trip Wolf goes, no problem. And they do a process. Uh, you know, long list, short list, LOI, goes through the whole thing, gets, I think, five 
offers, three of which are uh, to invest in the business, two of which are strategic acquisition offers, full-on acquisitions. He accepts one of the acquisition offers from Asa Abloy, one of the largest like Fortune 500 companies. They do, they're the guys who do elevators. And um, the moral of the story is selling your company is very much a who, not how uh, kind of concept. That's a, that's a Dan Sullivan term, but effectively, instead of trying to figure out how do I sell my company, the most important domino at the beginning of that process is to figure out who would be best to sell your company. And in Eric's case, he found Trip Wolf and that's exactly what they did. But I share the Eric uh, Levy story because he had both experiences, one going it alone, where he failed, the other months later, where he hired a professional, said run a process and got five acquisition or three acquisition, two acquisition offers and three capital raise. So I think it's a who not how problem. I think you really want a great M&A guy or right. gal. But it sounds like he had like a bluebird sort of just jump in the window with this guy Trip, you know, who ended up being like a really good, you know, good advisor. Um, yeah. You know, that, I mean, who knows what the, the true story is there. But I mean, if it, if it is that, if it, if it is, you know, that, that kind of dynamic, you know, what's the more, what's the more reliable way for someone to think about evaluating and hiring and finding an intermediary? Because they don't just necessarily email you and say, Hey, I love your product. And, uh, you know, yeah. and then it sort of comes up smelling like roses and you get three acquisition offers. So yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm oversimplifying it for sure. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things, uh, that, that you can do. One is to find a generalist who has a deep passion and understands what it is that you do. And the other is to find a specialist. So let me describe what I mean by that. So a generalist would be an M&A professional who sells companies in lots of different industries. And the benefit of that is that they are likely to invest more time in really understanding your secret sauce, figuring out what it is that makes your company really unique and why that's appealing to a potential acquirer. The other Op the other option is to go with a specialist, someone who specializes in selling companies in your industry. The only challenge, so the benefit of clearly they've got, you know, all the acquirers on speed dial, they know the market rates for companies, they know what the market terms are. It's going to be a much more lubricated process because they kind of know all the players in the space. The only word of caution I would, I would have for an entrepreneur who's thinking of using an industry specialist is if there's only two or three major acquirers in your industry, let's say you're at a, you know, a, a technology company and, and, and you're most likely to be acquired by Google, Apple, or Facebook, as an example. And there's an M&A professional who's, who spends most of their time selling companies to those three organizations. You have to remember that that M&A professional cannot burn a bridge with one of those three companies because that basically puts their business out of business, right? So they are, they are going to be less likely to fight for every last dollar for you because tomorrow they're gonna to be selling some other company to the same three companies. So if there's a very consolidated acquisition pool, like literally only two or three companies making acquisitions in your space, I would just have a little bit of caution around hiring an industry guru. Um, but if there's a wide, you know, swath of, of acquirers that, you know, if there's dozens or hundreds of potential acquirers, then look at an industry specialist is going to bring some unique, uh, proprietary sort of resources to the table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's the, I mean, what would you say, you know, if you were with the benefit of all of your expertise, if you were selling a business for, your own business in the next one to two years, what are some of the questions that you would ask a couple of intermediaries with whom you have an existing relationship? I mean, how would you, John Worlow, go about evaluating an intermediary and, and going through a selection process? Because, you know, the specialist and the generalist is a good way to sort of think about the top of the funnel, but, you know, ultimately as the entrepreneur, you're all alone. You've got to make this decision. Your VP of finance is not going to touch the third rail and, you know, and, and choose this investment banker for you, right? This is a, this is a CEO only decision. So when you're all alone thinking through this, how do you think about it yourself? I would be looking for their appreciation for our secret sauce. 
And my biggest red flag would be their attempt to bucket us in an industry that they know really well. The way that would sound uh, would be, oh yeah, yeah, John, I, I know you're, you run a software company. Like I know uh, MRR is the way you're gonna be valued and like LTV to CAC is gonna be so important for you. Right. And so we're ready to go. We sell software companies all the time, just like yours. <laughs> I'd be like big red flags, right? Because I, I don't want, and, and I think if for your M&A professional to be good, they have to get that, that, that little kernel that makes your company truly unique and stand out from the other businesses in my industry. So while I like people who understand the industry, and I think you should, as an entrepreneur, look for someone who really has a pretty good sense of the industry that you're playing in, I really get my hackles up if I'm hearing them trying to kind of commoditize us in that way. So yeah. just look for an appreciation for and being able to really articulate in a crisp way. Because when you think about the role of an M&A professional, they get a private equity group on the phone, they get a strategic on the phone, they've got a very short amount of time to articulate why that private equity group should spend another 30 seconds with them on the phone or spend another five minutes on the teaser. It's a very, very short amount of time to break through. And if they're unable to crisply articulate your value proposition, what makes you unique to you, they're never going to be able to make that case to a potential acquirer. So I'd listen and just hear them try to articulate for you what makes you guys unique. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's clear that, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of time invested up front in meeting different potential intermediaries, right? I mean, yeah. Do you have a general sense for the amount of lead time an entrepreneur should think about um, in order to just like begin to develop a deep enough rapport and a dialogue with a few potential intermediaries before picking, you know, uh, before picking one? In other words, if you wanted to sell your business tomorrow um, and you were in, you know, ground zero today in terms of meeting with intermediaries, how long would you want to sort of have developed some? some relationships before you actually began to, to, you know, begin preparing the business for a sale process. Yeah. It's like, do you remember that old expression? Like when's the best time to plant a tree? It's like 40 years ago. When's the second best time? Like right now, yeah. I, I guess I don't mean to be facetious in answering your question, but I think, you know, I think the savviest entrepreneurs have a handful, three to five yeah. M and a folks that they, that they think, would represent them well, and they are years before they want to sell, just yeah. cultivating, feeding that relationship, maybe an email, maybe a conversation twice a year, just to kind of check in, hear what they have to say about what's going on in the industry, maybe share a little bit of an update about what you're up to, but, but really sort of nurturing that relationship. Because look, it's a two-way street. If an m and professional is not confident they can sell your company, they're not going to want to take it to market, right? Because although there may be a work fee involved, they're going to get the lion's share of their success fee, the lion's share of their money through a success fee. So they're not going to uh, really be interested in, in, a, in a lot of spending a lot of time with you unless they're very confident they can sell your business. So for that reason, it's a little bit of a, a courting process. It's a lot like, I don't know if you've ever looked, have you ever looked at writing a book, Peter? Is that something you, you guys have thought about? I have. Yeah, I have. I mean, uh, the number of articles and eBooks that I've written you over the years in the back door, <laughs> I feel like I've, I, I feel like I should be able to claim that I have written a book, but I haven't, but yeah, I definitely have thought about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason I bring it up is it's a lot like, um, you know, if you want to get your book published by one of the big, you know, publishing houses in New York, Random House or, you know, Simon & Schuster, whatever the, all the big ones are, you don't actually go to the publisher. I mean, you can, but virtually everybody is denied. What you do is you find an agent yeah. and the agent is really the, the way the big publishing houses use an agent is they're the ones who vet the good books, right? Because the publishing house just doesn't have time to sift through hundreds of manuscripts to find the one or two good ones. They rely on the agent community, right? And the agent community in book publishing is going through and, and they're the first uh, 
uh, barrier you've got to overcome. If you want to get your book published, you've got to convince an agent that it's worth representing because like a, an M&A professional, they only get paid if you get an advance and get royalties, et cetera. So in a funny way, you're not really pitching your the publisher. You're actually, your first goal is to win the uh, response and respect of an agent. And in much the same way, I think it's the same thing with an M&A professional. You, you you in it, they're you know they're going to be courting you but in the same way you're doing a bit of courting them too like you want them to kind of uh be excited about representing you um i haven't answered your question but no i think i typical. think you have i mean i think the bottom line is you know if you you know if you haven't spent the time to develop any dialogue and any sort of relationship with a, an investment banker or an m a advisor um and you've now decided that you want to go to market, you've skipped some pretty significant steps. You really sounds like you want to at least have, you know, three to six months of dialogue with some intermediaries if you're going to do a rush, you know, sort of hustle out the door. But ideally, you maybe even have a few that you just send them an email update once a year with a you know, brief update on the business and you're just sort of nurturing those relationships so they can follow the story of the business for a while before, you know, before kicking into gear. That's what it sounds like. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the buyers in the market as well, because you spend a you, you spend a meaningful amount of time on on the intermediaries and the value that they can provide and that they should provide. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you're you're selling the business to the buyer, not to the intermediary. And you know, it, it, there, there, there's a lot of narrative out in, you know, in the world of M&A, both big cap M&A, but certainly also in the world of small cap M&A, there's a lot of narrative, there's a lot of cautionary tales, a lot of stories about, you know, I sold my business to a private equity firm and, you know, you know then I just sort of watched them destroy it month by month and get rid of the culture and this and that. There's also narratives out in the market that are, you know, about what happens when you, you know, sell your business to a trade buyer, right? A competitor, a partner, someone who's in an adjacent category. They're obviously referred to as strategic buyers in the parlance of, uh, of the M&A world. And, and, and so, you know, that, that I think creates a really interesting and very sort of paralyzing dynamic for a lot of business owners who have not been in and around the purchase and sale of businesses you know, just as a matter of, you know, as a matter of fact in their career, you know, they've really had their heads down for decades or for years. And now they go to the blogs or they go and read your book. And, you know, it sounds like private equity firms can be sharky. And it sounds like a corporate buyer is going to get rid of my, you know, manufacturing operation and move it to China. So it's, it doesn't really seem like there's a particularly attractive set of options if you want to sell your business, but that can't be true. So, you know, let's dive into the nuances of buyers a little bit. Like, are there only bad people in the private equity business? Are there only, you know, are there, you know, let's, let's get, let's cut through the, you know, the, the headline stories um, and get into, you know, get into some details. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you're absolutely right. So, so the, the two broad strokes categories that, that I read about a little bit are, are private equity groups and, and, and strategic buyers. And I think what I would counsel an entrepreneur on is, is that neither are necessarily good nor bad, but it is important to really go into the conversation knowing their motivations and knowing their end game. Um, because I think that just being informed in that way uh, allows you a fighting chance to get a, a you know reasonable deal out of either side. Um, this is a tough transaction. Like we're talking about transactions that have the ability to fundamentally change the life of the entrepreneur forever. I mean, for most people, this will be the only transaction they do of this kind, and it will be life-changing. And like signing a contract with a uh, you know, professional baseball team or doing some other really, really rare thing, it isn't really easy at the very top. And this, I would argue, building a business to multi, multi-millions of value is the very top point of entrepreneurship. So don't expect it to be easy. The other side are very sophisticated but I think you can buy yourself a fighting chance if you know their motivation. So again, I mean, in the, you know, 
in the book, we talk. I talk a little bit about private equity groups and the, and the, the idea uh, for them really generally is to is to kind of buy low and sell high. So they're you know they're buying your business. They generally pay a little less than a strategic, though not always. Um, they're using debt usually in order to improve their return on investment. And their goal within you know five or seven years. Uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, is to sell your company, often after aggregating or combining it with others and, and doing that at a higher multiple. And so that all sounds reasonable. And most private equity companies ask you to carry some equity, uh, the often overused term, the second bite of the apple, which hopefully we'll eradicate at some point. It's just such an overused term. But they'll ask you to usually retain some of your equity or roll it into the new entity and participate, if you will, in the sale of the business, whether that's three, five, seven years down. Again, this all sounds uh, perfectly reasonable until you, you say to yourself, well, how are they going to make the business worth more? Like how if, if they're going to buy my company for five times earnings and they're going to try to sell it for seven or eight times earnings, let's just say, like how are they going to get the, the, the lift? And the answer is they're going to professionalize your company. One of the ways they do that. The other way they do it is combine and create synergies and integrations and so forth. But one of the ways they do it is to, quote, professionalize the business. And professionalize the business is code for uh, eliminating all the things that you've done, the processes that you've created, the way that you manage your business, the, the sort of magic that goes into running your company day to day and replace that with policies, procedures, and spreadsheets, and professionals, like KPIs, and so forth. And, and that sounds, again, reasonable until you realize that as the author of those policies and procedures, that can feel a little bit like open-heart surgery without the anesthetic. <laughs> it can feel like your the soul of your company is being ripped apart and, and removed in an effort to sort of professionalize it. And so, if you know that going in, um, that can really help your conversations with the private equity group. You can talk to them about the way they would envision creating, uh, making it accretive, making it more valuable. What are the things that they envision doing? Who are the integrations that they see? Where do they see inefficiencies? And, and I think you can, you can explore all those conversations. But I think the, the, the bottom line is, is ask yourself, what's in it for them. Cause they're not trying to buy your business to hold it for 50 years, right? They're, they do in most cases want to, to, to sell the company later. And the question then becomes, well, how are they going to make that worthwhile? And, and that's what I'd be asking in the case of a private equity group. Right. Right. And is there a way to, to, to bind them um, in the transaction to, you know, a set, you know, one of the chapters in the book sort of talks about like, you know, your price, my terms. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, are there, are there ways to sort of have the terms of the transaction subject to this dialogue? So it's like, you know, you can only buy this business if you covenant to not move my labor offshore or get rid of my manufacturing facility or are those terms that theoretically are understandable, but pragmatically speaking, would never be agreed to by a professional buyer. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not certainly not an M and A lawyer. And I think that's like an M and A lawyer, an M and A attorney is in the really the best spot to sort of paper your deal and try to create um, uh, those covenants. And I think they're in a better position to say, you know, what's reasonable, what can be enforced, et cetera, than I could be. Um, I've seen a lot from the outside, but um, again, I'm, I, the, the intricacies of, of actually papering a share purchase agreement to try to uh, police or defend against some of those things, that's not my space. Uh, but again, one of the reasons to your earlier point about the, the, the real benefit of using an M&A attorney and not necessarily you know, a generalist attorney. But I can take a stab at, at sort of uh, you know, what I would, if it were you know, a friend of mine and they were thinking about selling to private equity, you know, I think having some really good conversations with the private equity group, um, making sure that you have a degree of mutual respect among one another. Um, I think it's difficult in COVID times where we can't break bread together. We can't go do social things and build that social capital. But at the same time, trying to make your best, do your best to, to do that. Um, the other thing that, that I think is, 
is is important for entrepreneurs to 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 kind of th think about is what proportion of their equity they're willing to carry into the new entity. Um, you know, if you really feel bullish about the future of your company and you really think that this private equity group, either their injection of capital or their injection of relationships is going to make a huge difference to the value of your company, you may want to carry a reasonable amount of equity. Um, but depending on where you are in your life, you may be de-risking, right? You may be trying to diversify your wealth. And so yeah. if all you do is take, you know, a big chunk of your wealth, roll it into another entity, and, and, and now you're, you know, risk on with a group that you don't fully control, that can be a problem. So asking yourself what proportion you're willing to roll. You know, I'm a big believer, like I, if, if for me as an entrepreneur, I want, like, if I'm going to put a lot of eggs in one basket, um, I, I want to own the basket. <laughs> I don't want to be along for the ride or minority shareholder. Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it's Buffett's you know, old saying, like, put all your eggs in a few baskets and watch them like a hawk or something. Was that Buffett or something like that? I think yeah. I, I want to get it the definitely, he definitely believes in concentration more than diversification um, uh, yeah. for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I mean, look, if you're, let, let's say you, you do a majority recapitalization, meaning you sell the majority of your shares to private equity group, you sell 70% and roll 30% equity into a new entity. You've now got 30% of your equity in an entity that you likely don't fully control, right? Like you likely don't have a say when and if they sell. Um, and so that's not a comfortable position for a lot of entrepreneurs to have that much wealth in a business they, they don't control. Yeah. Even though they may be the CEO of the company and, and have sort of broad management um, uh purview, they just may not feel total control of, of that sort of, uh, situation. And so for small and mid-sized businesses, I mean, are, is there a robust market for those businesses to sell a non-controlling stake in their business, take some money off the table and, and be able to retain a lot of the control um, in the process? I mean, how, how much do you feel like private equity just needs to sort of evolve more substantially into a minority, you know, into sort of minority partnership in their orientation? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of business owners who might substantially prefer to sort of just say, listen, instead of me selling 70% and keeping 30%, why don't I just sell 30% and keep 70%, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is that an easier trans? Or how what's your sense for those transactions, the feasibility of those transactions for small businesses? The majority of the time, it seems like private equity is overwhelmingly focused on change of control transactions where they acquire control of the yeah. business. Um, what are your thoughts there? What do you think could change or should change there? Yeah, I don't see it changing. I would tend to agree, Peter. I think the majority of, of deals in the mid-market, the private equity group is looking for a change of control. They are looking for majority you know, um, interest in the business. And, and look, if I was investing in a private equity fund, uh, I would want you know, the guys you know, stewarding, like with the responsibility to steward that fund to make a controlling position in a company they're buying. I, I wouldn't want them to be buying you know, privately held businesses. They own some minor, majority, minority stake in that they have no liquidity rights, et cetera. So look, I think there are, the private equity groups are, um, are, are, are doing right by their investors by looking for majority um, controlling interest. Uh, but venture you know, capitalists are, are comfortable with minority. What, what, like, what, what accounts for that? that get the comfort that they have it's a private illiquid company and so is the I mean, you know yeah 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 it's a it's a good point and i'm not sure i have a good answer uh i i don't know i you know i, I, I look clearly uh, vcs are investing in, in very different companies ones with yeah. you know nine out of ten they expect to fail or, or become kind of the living dead and 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 one will be the next unicorn so i you know i don't know i i think that would be an interesting question for uh, VCs. I mean, they obviously 
venture capitalists are very sophisticated investors and oftentimes have lots of different uh, ways to paper a deal that although they're buying a minority stake, they still have lots of control uh, to do what they want or, or ensure that the CEO of that company does what they want. I'm reminded of a story in the book. Have you, um, have you ever, uh, or you would remember it because you, you read the manuscript. Do you remember the Rand Fishkin story? Yeah, SEL Moz, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, you know, a real cautionary tale, but, but, uh, but he built, you know, built the business up. I think it was five and a half million bucks of revenue. He runs, um, he ran a company called SEO Moz, which was a, a software company that did SEO and it's built up to, I think, five and a half million dollars in revenue, but was on the road to 10. So it felt like they were going to double. Yep. He gets a call from Brian Halligan, who is the co-founder of HubSpot and says to Rand, look, I want to, you know, think of buying your company. We want to make an offer. He offers him 25 million cash and HubSpot stock. And Fishkin says, well, you know, you know, we're going to be to 10 and, 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 and Fishkin had the number four times forward revenue in his mind. That was sort of what he wanted. So he's thinking we're at 10 at the end of this year, four times that is 40 million. Halligan's at 25. So he says no to Halligan's 25. Uh, Fishkin instead rounds, raises a round of venture capital, minority stake to your point earlier, but with some hooks or strings attached. Ultimately, the v uh, Fishkin invests in a bunch of businesses with all this extra cash. Those other businesses, in many cases, don't do as well as he'd hoped. He has to shut down some of these business units. He goes into uh, a period of depression, in fact, for him personally, and he's removed by the venture capitalists from the day-to-day -day operations of the company. He becomes basically ousted as the CEO. The VCs have preferred shares, and they still hold the business. He has some minority shares in the company, but it's not liquid. They, they have apparently no intent to sell the business and therefore he's on the sidelines, no control. And they have preferred, they have a preferred return kind of locked into their agreement. And so when I asked him like, what do you think your shares are worth? He said, they, they might not be worth anything um, based on the return that the VCs are guaranteed. And I said, what out of interest would that HubSpot offer be worth today? That wasn't very nice of you. And he said, you know, and he said, well, based on the appreciation of HubSpot's publicly traded stock, yeah. it would be worth close to $200 million today. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, HubSpot's a $15, 16000000000 billion business now. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, these are such significant decisions and... Obviously, the hindsight is always so clear. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really you know it's all, it seems like all the decisions you know you you can write the stories, you can cherry pick the Cinderella stories or cherry pick the cautionary tales, but it just seems like all of these decisions are really really high stakes. Picking an intermediary, picking a capital partner, um, picking your M and A lawyer, um, you know they're they're very, very, very high stakes decisions. Yeah. Um, and I guess if anything else, you know, usually if you're making a very high stakes decision or a one way door decision, you probably want to take your time doing it. Um, it's amazing how quickly entrepreneurs, I think, make some of these decisions. Um, you know, they, it's, it's, it's broadly accepted that you should be dating someone for many years before you decide to marry them, right? That's a relatively well-accepted practice. And, and How well did you do that one, Peter? I did very well. Thank you very much. I did very oh, well. Good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. look, you know, it, you know, of course it can work out if you, you know, go on a first date and decide to propose in Vegas a week later. That, that, that works. Um, but I would say it probably works a lot less than, you know, a little bit more of a deliberate pace. So, um, if anything, you know, it's, it's funny and not to, um, to, to be too commercial in our conversation, but it's actually one of the reasons I wanted to write this book because I, uh, it is not, I'm not an M&A professional, nor do I run a private equity group. I don't have a dog in the fight. So, uh, in the sense that I wanted to be as transparent as possible. And I think you know, you could say that that the book's a little snarky to private equity groups. I don't mean it to be gratuitously snarky, but it is 
you know, I, I've tried to lay out some of the pitfalls of all of the acquirers, including private equity groups and strategics. But I, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right. These are really high stakes decisions. And everywhere you turn, I think an entrepreneur feels like someone's got their hand out or in their hand in their pocket. Yeah. So they go to their accountant and they say, hey, do you know an M&A professional? Well, whether they know it or not, that accountant may be getting a spiff, yep. a referral fee for re recommending the M&A firm. Then they go to the M&A firm and says, well, like, do you think, you know, you could sell my business? Well, not only is that an unbiased question, because of course, if they do sell your business, they stand to gain hundreds of thousands of dollars in a success fee. Um, maybe they go to their M&A attorney and get an unbiased point of view. But again, for them, they're like, let's let the, 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 the hourly rate roll here. This is great. This is, you know, the more I complicate this deal, the more in my fee. So everybody's got kind of, there's some, you know, there's some, someone taking something out of this. And I yeah. think times entrepreneurs feel like enough already. I just want a straight answer. And the problem is where they get straight answers in many other areas of their business life, their YPO forum, their tech or Vistage forum. A lot of the people in those forums have not done what you're about to do. And so although you can get great advice from your marketing, like on marketing or on hiring an employee or on firing an employee, all that stuff, there's tons of stuff out there. There is very little out there unbiased on how do you effectively answer some of these really high stakes questions? And I think it's so, it, it, they're so important to get right, yet so hard to do just given the landscape. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I mean, the only things I would add to what is in your book and what we've covered is that um, I think it's really important for the entrepreneurs to just understand the incentives of everybody who is party to the transaction, right? Well so, said. you know, when you hire an investment banker to sell your business, they really don't generate a rewarding amount of economics unless a transaction closes of some, you know, appreciable value, right? And so what that means is, it's hard for them to not want you to just sell it to someone, right? Because from a financial pers perspective, if you don't sell it, they may have done a lot of work with, with no rewards. See, they're going to, whether they are good people and high integrity people or not, there's going to be something inside of them that they may not even put their finger on that's going to be like nudging them to get you to sell the business, right? And if you think about the investment professional at a private equity firm or the, you know, the corporate buyer, they may really like you a great deal, right? They may genuinely like you. They may have a really high quality relationship with you built over the course of time, but they also have a boss. They have a set of incentives, mm -hmm. right? If you're a private equity firm, you have raised capital from capital owners of capital and you are obligated to act as a fiduciary on their, on their behalf. So if they buy your business and they think that the right thing to do is to remove you, or they think that the right thing to do is to offshore your manufacturing, they, they can be in a real bind where, you know, their, you know, their heart and their soul want to keep, you know, you know, keep the business in, you know, the small town that it was built in, et cetera, but they're fiduciary to a set of people who have given them capital and they're responsible for driving a return. So I've seen a lot of people, just forget about the incentives that sit down at the foundation of these transactions and become charmed by very high quality, very charismatic people who sit across the table from them. And it's not that they're being deceitful, it's just at the end of the day, the incentives typically rule, rule the outcome. And, um, well said. and that for some reason is, is, is really easy to forget about when you're an entrepreneur. You, know, you really wanna feel like they're your partner, and, but you, you, you just can't be naive to the incentives that sort of sit down at the foundation of their businesses. Um, yeah, it's, it's so well said. I mean, um, there was a, a story I, I, uh, I, I had, I had uh, the woman on the podcast. I can't remember. I think it might've been, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the name. Uh, she ran a, a letter processing business. They sent letters out on behalf of hospitals with statements and stuff like that. Very kind of simple middle America kind of business. 
Um, but a big part of what she did from day one was profit sharing. And she was, you know, like she was such a believer in sharing the profits. She, first of all, did it equally by employee, no matter what, how big or, you know, big a job they had or how junior they were, how long they'd had been with them. She shared the same amount with each employee. She felt so passionately about this kind of egalitarian perspective of sharing profits. And she did that from day one. Well, 20 years later, these checks that were like five and $10 were, you know, reasonably big checks to all these employees, you know, hundreds of dollars. And again, for a lot of her employees that were being paid by the hour, it was a huge part of their, you know, their rewards. And so she sells her company to a private equity group. And um, about a year after selling, they take a look at this profit sharing plan. And, and, they, and, and to your point, here's where the rewards or the incentive systems are in conflict. Because the entrepreneur would say, no, no, the profit sharing plan is, and she did say that the profit sharing plan is a fundamental element of our culture right? Like you can't take that away because it's why people stay. It's why people, they have stayed for many years. So they would make a qualitative argument as to why to keep the profit sharing plan. Yet the private equity group is not into qualitative arguments, right? They have a, to your point, a fiduciary responsibility to act in the interests of their shareholders and in their investors in this case. And so if they see an incentive, like a, 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 a profit sharing plan that makes no economic sense, that is overpaying people on paper, the spreadsheet says you remove that and you return our investment goes up. Why don't we remove it? Yeah. And again, it's, it's not that they're bad people. It's just that they have different bosses, right? And they have different incentive systems and requirements, frankly. Right. So the entrepreneur looks at it and says, you know, the money hungry, greedy PE firm came and got rid of my profit sharing plan. Right. And yet the prop, the PE guy goes, no, no, I, my, I have a responsibility here to make this business as profitable as it can be. And this doesn't make sense on paper. But and the, so irony, the irony is that I think, and I think where people get really frustrated is when, is when the private equity firm sort of invokes their fiduciary duty as the basis for change. And then they ended up actually driving a terrible return because they changed the culture. They got rid of the profit sharing plan. Everybody starts to leave the business. And, and now you have a company that's just got, you know, it's got no culture left, right? So it's really a very interesting judgment call for these private equity firms to try and figure out what does it truly mean to professionalize these businesses, right? Like, because sometimes you professionalize the business and you actually kind of ruin the business and then other mm -hmm. times you professionalize the business and you really you 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 really do make great improvements i mean you renovate Absolutely. the kitchen and you know the business runs a lot better um so there's a lot of art and a lot of expertise in private equity i've seen over the years where you know they say you know what we're not going to touch that we're just we're not going to touch that profit sharing model that's part of the heart and soul of this organization and as fiduciaries that actually is in our interest to not touch. And I think that's, you know, that it's, 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 um, it's going to be very interesting to sort of see how private equity firms think about, you know, whether the spreadsheet way of doing business, you know, over the next, you know, 10 to 20 years is actually right more often than it is wrong versus mm -hmm. the, the founder's instincts. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's really well, well said. It'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. How, how would you have answered the question that you asked of me, me, which was, have you seen savvy sellers paper or protect those things that are most important to them in a share purchase agreement? For example, a, you know, a, a profit sharing plan. Have you, have you seen sellers successfully kind of um, protect those, those things that they view as foundational? I mean, I think that, you know, there you look a, a good lawyer can draft you know any term right it, and that term just like the the price of your business the term terms exist in a marketplace as well right so if a buyer says to you hey i want two years of exclusivity to do due diligence on your business you would just say <laughs> nfw right that's not a market term right yeah. so there there's a whole bunch of terms that you know the terms exist in a marketplace just like the price exists in a marketplace so you as the seller could say, listen, you can buy the business for $50 million or whatever the number is, 
but you know, if, but you can't fire me, you can't fire my CFO, you can't change your compensation plan without me, you know, and, and you could draft all those terms. Some of those terms, the buyer is just going to say, listen, we need a certain amount of agency over the business. And mm-hmm. that term just doesn't allow us to do that. So you could draft a term that says, if you decide you want to offshore, you know, the manufacturing for the business, um, that triggers the following, you know, the following outcome, right? If the following outcome is that you as the seller have the right to repurchase the business for a dollar, they're <laughs> going to say, they're going to say no. So I, I, I think, you know, I think thinking through these things is very interesting. I mean, I do think that there are uh, business owners who have made a point to say, listen, if, if I'm going to sell the business to you, I want to be able to retain control of the business day to day. I don't want to integrate our finance and our HR organization. I do not want to lay off. Like I don't want cost side synergies. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think some well-known examples of that. um, One very well-known example in, in sort of this world, the information and sort of M&A world was capital IQ. It was acquired Mm -hmm. by S and P and they really left that business alone for many, 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 many years. But ultimately Mm -hmm. they, they did begin to integrate it. And it's really when they integrated it that they began to sort of have the brain drain uh, occur in that business. I think Instagram was very, very much left alone by Facebook for, mm-hmm. for multiple years um, in many, many, many ways. Um, but you know, ultimately the ability to, and the need to monetize that asset in order to drive growth for Facebook and to drive returns for shareholders, you know, led to more and more tension and conflict between, you know, the founders of, of uh, Instagram who continued to run it and Mark Zuckerberg and, and his power apparatus at Facebook. Um, and, you know, the founders just walked out one day. So, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, if you've decided that you want to sell your business, you really need to understand that you, in the act of selling your business, you really are surrendering control of the business. And you need to really appreciate the full definition of what that means and the full ramifications of what that means. You can't be a crybaby two years later, three years later, uh, uh, or be naive in thinking that you didn't sell control when, when you, when you did sell control, you know, you, you've sold control of the business in exchange for a financial outcome. And, you know, you need to, to act like a grown up about what, you know, the transaction that you executed. I do yeah. think that's why, you know, I, I, I do hope over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, I very much hope that private capital markets, private equity operators and, and others can continue to step into the market and provide different forms of capital solutions to, to business owners that honor the control of the entrepreneur in, in ways that, you know, sort of expand the the way that an owner can think about partnering with, with different private capital partners, right? That it's not just, well, I'm gonna to sell to a private equity firm and surrender control, but I'd like to see more solutions emerge where entrepreneurs feel like there's a certain amount of control that they can retain. I think the other thing that I just don't see happen enough is many, many of these businesses generate relatively predictable profits. And one of the things that you know is a pretty cool trick that you can do is, um, you know, if your business is generating cash relatively predictably, you can lever up your own business Mm -hmm. without bringing in a, you know, an outside private equity partner. You know, if your business is generating $5 million of, of cash every year, you can probably get a slug of debt, you know, uh, put on that business without endangering the business overly. You can take that debt and you can pay yourself out as the owner of a business, a big chunk of, 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 of debt, um, and then use the cash generating profitability of the business to pay down the debt that you've taken on over time. You're not gonna get as big a payout that way as if you sell the whole business, but you know, it's a way for you to extract liquidity from your business um, without surrendering any control at all. Uh, now, if things go bad, um, you know, the banks <laughs> are, um, you know, the banks are in control, but, you know, if things go bad, then, you know, you've got, you've got, uh, you've got bigger issues anyway. So I don't see a lot of, you know, leveraged recapitalizations of businesses that happen where there is no outside party involved. But I actually think that 
it's an underutilized approach that private business owners that have cash flowing businesses should they should think about doing doing more of that. Um, yeah, you know, and the other thing that I would I sort of maybe layer onto your ideas is that for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, I think we think about uh, selling as a one-time spectacular event, right? Like you, you kind of sell your company and then you you hand the keys to the buyer and then you kind of rot off into the sunset. And, and I think what's much more common is, is a sort of gradual uh, sale of the company. So for example, a private equity company would, you know, buys a majority stake in your business, but you've got to hold, you know, a, a significant chunk for maybe years into the future, three, five, seven years in the future. Another very common outcome is a, is a, is an earnout where you, you know, you sell a company, in particular in a service business where the, the owner's deeply sort of integral to the company, you have a set of goals to hit and they could be three, five, seven years in the future. So I think, we, we, two things. One, I think we, we would serve ourselves well as an entrepreneurial community to think of the transaction as more gradual and, and less spectacular, if you will, and, and also sell much earlier than feels naturally natural. So a lot of people I think sell, you know, say, oh yeah, like I want to travel when I'm older. And so when I turn 65, I'm going to pull that trigger. Well, little do they know that, that, that there's still another three, five, seven years on the back end of that, of that event, because again, selling is generally not hand the keys and, and walk out the door. Right. And I think we would do ourselves a lot uh, a better service to, to sell earlier while we still got energy, excitement, and enthusiasm for the company so that we can contribute to that, that, that next tranche, that, that earn out, et cetera. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about COVID um, just because every business owner, um, whether they sell as part of um, the sort of COVID period in, in the world's history or whether they sell probably many years after is, is going to be impacted regardless, right? I mean, it's become, it's become such a significant impact that people are going to be wondering what is a business's ability to withstand another pandemic, right? So let, let's talk about COVID and its impact on the sale of businesses, both in the near term, but longer term as well. I mean, what have you been talking about when you give talks these days, when you're fielding you know, questions via email from business owners, what's top of mind for a lot of business owners right now with respect to COVID and what kind of conclusions are you drawing? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot. I think everybody wants their value to be based on the numbers pre-COVID and every buyer wants to value based on the numbers post-COVID. And so that's, that's a problem, right? Um, because most acquirers are going to look at a trailing 12 months and they're going to say, look, your business took a crap in March and April of, of 2020 and, and maybe it hasn't still recovered. So number one, there's a bit of give and take there, right? You as the entrepreneur is going to, assuming your business was negatively impacted by COVID, it most were, you're going to want to make a case that, hey, for the last you know 10 years prior to COVID, look at all the money we made, look at how reliable, this was a black swan event. It's happened once every hundred years. Uh, therefore, you should value us based on pre-COVID you know, financials. Yeah, the buyer is going to do exactly the opposite. They're going to say, no, no, it's trailing 12 months. And you know, this is what your 12 months are. And therefore, we're going to apply a multiple against whatever. So I think the, the, that's the natural conflict and the natural tension that exists. And hopefully, deals are going to get done somewhere in the middle with acquirers recognizing something about what happened prior to COVID and, and, the, and, and sellers realizing that they've got to take the hit on, on their trailing 12 months. So that's kind of one thought. I think... Um, COVID is, unless you're in a, in, a, in a business that happened to have benefited from COVID, again, that's not the majority of businesses. There are a few, but most businesses were negatively impacted. It is the ultimate acid test for the reliability of your earnings, right? So just how sticky are your customers um, is really revealed through some sort of really negative experience, right? And so this is a really easy way for acquirers to judge just how susceptible your business is to economic cycles. And of course, the less susceptible it is, the more valuable it is in the eyes of an acquirer because your earnings are going to be much more reliable. So 
I think for those businesses that were able to sail through COVID and not have a materially negative outcome, I think they just get more attractive because they've gone through the ultimate uh, rinse cycle and they have proven themselves, right? Equally, if your business was really terribly impacted, I think a seller really needs to be realistic and say, that hurts you on two fronts. Number one, a savvy acquirer is going to look at trailing 12 months. Number two, it also is a bit of an indictment of the reliability of your business model because it it didn't hold up under scrutiny. So I don't know. Those are a couple of thoughts. What what's what do you think? Uh, well, I guess yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm you know what how, I think. I'm curious what entrepreneur should how, how an entrepreneur should rebut. Um, you know, let's say COVID. You know. I mean, COVID is not going to go anywhere in 2021, even with a vaccine. But let's say we're talking about 2023, right? And it's the end of 2023. And you can post 12 months of financials and COVID's got a vaccine by then. You know, is it is it going to be reasonable for a buyer to say, hey, can you show me your financials from uh, 2020 and 2021 and sort of, you know, um, show me sort of how you handled that period? Or is that, you know... Is, how should an entrepreneur think about hmm. it when it's, you know, intermediate history as opposed to immediate history? And I think that's, yeah. you know, that's, you know, it's like, is COVID a, an acid test for how your business responds to an, you know, an economic cycle? Or is COVID an acid test for how your business responds to a once in a hundred year, uh, you know, pandemic, right? Yeah. That's well, I, I think if, yeah, if I were an acquirer, I would and I would be looking at the results in in sort of March, April, May as a way to evaluate how the business performs in a pandemic, which to your point, hopefully only ever ever happens once every hundred years. But I would also look at the fall of 2020 when the economy has been struggling in a lot of sectors um, and say, how did this business perform? in those economic searches. So I think you can evaluate both the economic downturn as well as the, as, as the pandemic, but I would just be looking at different, probably different quarters, Q2 for the pandemic and probably Q3 or Q4 for, you know, the effect and the economic impact it has on the business. And yeah, look, I think it's going to, in 2023, will it have an impact? You know, a savvy buyer will probably go back that far and out of curiosity, look, it's going to have much bigger impact on, on entrepreneurs looking to sell in 2021, right? Because they're obviously, um, it's the most immediate and it's very fresh. And what are, you know, we just did, it's funny, we, um, as you know, I run a company called Value Builder and we have 55,000 businesses that have gone through and completed this questionnaire. And we just looked at and compared the results on a number of different questions, pre-COVID and post-COVID. And it's fascinating to see the changes that entrepreneurs have made post COVID. Um, we're gonna be coming out with some a new white paper on this topic, but just to give you a sneak preview, um, one of the big changes is that post COVID entrepreneurs are much less likely to wanna pass their business on to their family members. And we could riff and debate as to why that might be. Uh, my hypothesis is likely that it's been an incredible burden through COVID, right? Many businesses have felt this is incredible burden, incredible stress, and, and they don't want to burden their kids with the same level of stress and therefore have changed their exit sort of strategy or thinking from, oh yeah, I'm going to pass this business down to my kids to, no, no, as soon as I can, I'm going to sell this thing because I don't want to- really interesting. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I yeah. was, um, you know, uh, I, I have another question, which, I, and, you know, maybe it, it's going to be in your white paper. So I won't ask you to share all the all the nuggets from the white paper um, uh, in advance. But, you know, in you wrote another book, John, called The Automatic Customer, which yeah. talks about sort of like, uh, talks about a lot of things. But one of the things that it really tries to focus businesses on is building more recurring revenues into their business, because businesses mm -hmm. with recurring revenues tend to be more resilient. They tend to be businesses because of that resiliency and that predictability that makes them more valuable, right? And so, and, and, and the book talks a lot about sort of trying to take uh, recurring revenue and apply it into markets where it hasn't historically been you know, the, the default practice, the default yeah. standard. I'm curious whether or not, um, 
there are a set of techniques or you know ideas that you have for sort of how business owners should be thinking about running the businesses that they run differently as a result of COVID right now. I'm not talking about whether or not they hand them off to their son or their daughter. I'm talking about are there things that they can are, are there things that these entrepreneurs can do differently to build a more COVID sort of post COVID resilient business similar to you know the idea of incorporating recurring revenue uh, into into your business even when uh, it's unconventional. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think that is the, 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 the probably the, arguably the best strategy any entrepreneur that wants to inoculate themselves from the next COVID or the next economic downturn. I think creating recurring revenue is, is the strategy. And so I think the way to think about that is most people, when they think about, especially if, I mean, clearly if you're a software company, a media company, you're already well down the road of, of creating recurring revenue because you're using a SaaS sort of business model. The, the challenge and what I tried to write about in the book um, is really about how do you, how do you create recurring revenue in an industry that doesn't lend itself? Let's say you have a plumbing company or you have an HVAC company, like how do you create recurring revenue in those businesses? And I think the mistake a lot of us make when we think about that is we think, okay, how do I create recurring revenue for all of my customers? And, and, and I think the secret to creating recurring revenue is in fact to niche down and segment your list of customers into very homogeneous segments that have very similar needs for why they buy your product or service. And once you understand that, common denominator among that very unique segment of your market, then you can create recurring revenue. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a company actually based near you, Peter, in, um, in New York called H Bloom. Uh, again, I wrote about them in the book. They're in the business of selling flowers. They went from, uh, you know, they looked at the business of selling flowers, most of which are sold through retail stores, very lumpy, very transactional. There's no way to predict the sort of ebb and flow other than sort of big holidays like Valentine's Day. And they said, no, no, we're, we're going we're gonna to sell flowers, but we're going to do it on a recurring basis. And, and they picked hotels and they said, hotels need flowers on the reception table because they want to give that very prestigious image. So we're going to go to four and five star hotels and sell them a subscription to flowers. So they didn't try to create a subscription for flowers for every type of person who buys flowers, the person who goes to a funeral, wedding, whatever. They said, no, no, we're going to niche down and figure out all the people that buy cut flowers from us. And one tiny little niche was high-end hotels. Yeah. And that's the raw material from which they built H Bloom, that insight. And so I think that once you identify recurring revenue as that what you want as the secret sauce to create more value in your company, the next step is not to try to create something for everybody, but really niche down and, and then design a recurring revenue model for your homogeneous segments. Mm -hmm. And so you think just the best antidote to sort of a post COVID world is not something specific to counteracting COVID, um, COVID's impacts. It's just, it's just find a way to generate recurring revenue. It just in all markets, that's, that's the best, that's the best way to, to increase the value and the resiliency of the business. Yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, the whole, the final chapter on COVID has clearly not even close to being written yet. Right. I think we'll learn a lot about how society has reacted to this pandemic, best practices, what, you know, what worked, what didn't. And, and I think we'll be better as a society as a result of those best practices. We'll learn a lot of, of, from this, uh, you know, things we did right and things that we could have done better. So I'm, I'm much more hopeful that, you know, through our lifetimes, um, we won't experience another pandemic in clearly the same way. However, what I'm very confident in is that we will have some other black swan that we haven't thought about that will ha have a huge impact on the business world. So if you think back through our lifetimes, like even since we've known each other, I, I think we met first after 9-11, but it wasn't that long after 9-11, if I remember. Yeah, it right. was sort of right around the, you know, the, the Great Recession with Lehman Brothers. So okay. you know, yeah, I mean, okay. I agree. If it's not a pandemic, it's, it's, it's something else. <laughs> there's something else, right? Like, you know, 9-11 and then there's the great recession, uh, you know, then there's COVID. So we don't, who knows what it's going to be, but uh, I don't think it'll be another pandemic, but I do think there'll be something else that will have a material impact on lots of companies. 
Yeah. So um, I've got uh, two more things, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, sure. You know, on all of these fancy podcasts that I now listen to when I go for my run, a lot of these guys have these sort of uh, questions that they ask all of their guests. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to rip off one of the podcasts that I like a lot, uh, rip off the question from it. And I'm going to make it a little bit specific to, to the world of entrepreneurs sure. um, and, and, and your expertise around entrepreneurship and, and buying and building and selling businesses. So the question is this, if you um, get to be the emperor of the world for one day, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, just before you go on, Pierre, I, ju I just had a funny conversation over dinner with my, my, my kids, two boys. And, and they're like, you know, if it were me, I'd run it like a dictatorship. It would be me and I would decide and no one else would have a say. And I'd put the military outside. And like, it was just so funny, like the way a child's brain works anyways emperor for day i love it yeah no so it sounds like you've you you've had a dress rehearsal for this question <laughs> yeah like. totally so you're emperor for a day and you can confer one skill or one novel like very sort of key piece of information to all of the world's entrepreneurs running businesses mm -hmm. what what is the one key skill or the one key really unique piece of information that you would want to give the world's entrepreneurs to put them in, in, uh, in a better position. Hmm. What a great question. You know, I think there is a real, uh, power to curiosity. And I think, I think being curious is uh, the superpower of a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs of our lifetime, that, that desire to understand. Uh, so I would apply it to, you know, acquirers being curious about their motivations, their incentives, uh, but equally to customers, right? Why is a customer buy? Why don't they buy? What is around the corner? Um, so I think, curiosity is probably the entrepreneur's superpower. And the more we can hone those skills, the, the better. I love that answer. Um, we're almost done. I just want to make sure that you get a chance to let people know where they can learn more about you, about the books you've written, about the tools and the resources that you've spent a significant part of your career making available entrepreneurs. So let me just give you the floor so that you can just share where people can learn from you uh, about everything that you've put out there, John. Well, thanks, Peter. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. So I think the best place to go is builttosell.com. If you opt in, in other words, provide your email address, you will get a weekly episode of Built to Sell Radio, which is where I interview an entrepreneur and ask them about the sale of their company. I ask them what they would do differently if they had it to do over again, what they learned from the process, the do, you know, the do's and don'ts and mulligans and so forth. And so uh, it's free. And I think the guests that I've, I've been able to interview, uh, I'm forever indebted to them because they've provided just a tremendous sort of uh, school for me to go to school on. Uh, so people like Rand Fishkin and Eric Levy, people that we've talked about in this conversation, yeah. uh, you know, all came from there. So it's, yeah, just built to sell.com and, and uh, opt in and we'll, we'll get you a new episode every week. Fantastic. And is there a website for, um, for the upcoming book or is that going to be on the built to sell radio uh, website as well? Yeah, all roads lead to builttosell.com. So all right, sounds if, good. if you opt in, you, you, I dare say you'll get maybe the odd email suggesting you go out and grab a copy. <laughs> John, I mean, thank you for making the time. Congratulations on creating another book, which will definitely make its way into the entrepreneur's canon. Um, and uh, just grateful for what you've done for, for entrepreneurship uh, around the world and, and for giving me an opportunity to, to interview you in advance of uh, your latest production. So thank you so much. Well, I'm forever indebted to you, Peter, and uh, great to be with you. So thank you. Thanks, John.